Hello, friends. Uh, my name is Steve, and welcome to the Friday Conversation, episode one hundred. Uh, we will be. It's a long. It's a. Long, <laughs> it's a long recording today. Uh, we're going to do two-hour blocks, so we'll wrap up every two hours, and then later I'll release them in two-hour blocks and see if anybody shows up. We'll see. Uh, so far, we have uh, Dan and Joe here. Dan, uh, will you start us off? Yeah, my name is Dan, uh, a.k.a. Hanukkah Harry. Uh, actually, Harry is my first name. Uh, I've gone by my middle name my entire life. So uh, there you go. You're getting a whole story in my introduction. Uh, but my name is Dan. I uh, My channel's name is the Black and Blue Collar Reader, and I read lots of I'm going to be nice. This is your first couple seconds on the channel, so I'm not going to curse. I read a lot of Good stuff, part. and I, I review a lot of shit, okay? And, uh, yeah, uh, check me out if you haven't already. Go ahead, Joe. I'm Joe, JCM Byrne. Uh, I wrote Wistful Ascending, three other books in the Hybrid Helix, uh, Partial Function, and I have an ongoing weekly free magazine called Grindor of which two issues are currently out. Um, that sounds like a lot. And uh, find me at jcmburn.com, uh, Twitter, uh, and my my Patreon is actually how I'm trying to organize the release of the magazine, because you can join with a free tier and get every link. So you don't have to give me money, but it's just a way for me to track who's actually getting it. And uh, so far, we'll, well, we'll see. But that's me. And I'm super excited to be here. And congratulations, Steve, on 100. Yes. So that yes. is a phenomenal achievement. It um, is. A uh, little wild. Really. <laughs> a little <Yes>. wild. <laughs> that was really something. It was a year ago on this show where I told my favorite ever joke. Tell us again. Yes, please. Well, Joe Carroll, who was supposed to be here, was talking about, we we're talking about genres and happy endings. And, he, and, 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 you know, the romance genre, it's expected to have a happy ending. And, and I say, you know, books are like a massage parlor. You, know, you don't always want to admit it, but everyone who's in there probably wants a happy ending. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was I'll totally joking. admit it. I, I had no qualms <laughs> telling you I want a happy ending, damn it. <laughs> are we talking books, though, or books and, you know, women? <laughs> So, and that was unplanned. Joe just set me up perfectly, and I was well lubricated with the tequila. So, uh, <laughs> that, that not, always helps the humor roll, doesn't it? <laughs> it makes me. Ever, I, I think I'm funnier when I'm drunk. I don't know if I actually. Uh, am. <laughs> Joe, there's Tech. there's very few. I, I consider my humor in a um, in top level tier. I, I think I got it. Uh, Joe, you're one of those guys I think got it. You know, you just it just uh comes to you, and uh, I love that you know, at times you don't fucking apologize for it, and I, I don't think we should unless we really, you know, stepped over a line or something. <laughs> I try, I try to be, I you know, I, there are places I won't go out loud, right? There are things I won't make fun of, like I'll have thoughts and I'll be like, no, don't say that one, Joe. So like, but that's because I'm fifty something, right? You see, twenty years yeah, ago, twenty five years, you ago, don't stay yet. Very different. You're like maybe I shouldn't say it right now at forty. I'm almost forty five. I'm telling you, you know, if it's something's bothering me and it's you know it's a a matter that I have a, an opinion on, then I'll let you know it, you know. And uh, I I think uh, Joe definitely um, doesn't tiptoe, but he'll he'll let you know if something's bothering him. I like that. I think that's real. That's just my opinion. Yeah. It is tough, right? Because what you could say 10 years ago, you can't, you just really can't say, a, you know, well, you can, but you're going to, you know, offend somebody. Expectations were different and it's appropriate. Like, I'm sorry, if you go back in time to someone like in the 90s and go like, okay, you knew a trans person and you didn't, re you didn't ask someone their pronouns. Like, that just wasn't a thing you did. I'm sorry. There were, no one did that, right? Like, that's just the culture. And maybe we all should have been, if you want to say we should have been doing that in the 90s, I'm not going to argue, right? Yes, I agree. We, but no one did. And um, I still have trouble with it. I called uh, another author, him, and then I didn't even realize I went on his, uh, uh, I did it again. I went on their uh, uh, Twitter like yesterday because someone else called them they. And I was like, oh, mother, mother. And I knew this This person presents as male, has a male first name, and um, wants to be called that. I'm like, 
I should have done better. I don't. They weren't mad at me, as, as far as I can tell. Like they never said a word. Like we're 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 Twitter buddies. You know how that is, right? Yeah. No, but you like to to. You know, I do not want to offend anybody. As much yeah. as much as I like to be funny and, and things like that, this is you know this, and I am now uh, interacting with a larger community than I used to, um, and I always want to be proper. I never want to offend anyone. But listen, these are habits uh, yeah. that are ingrained in us for for centuries. Him her uh you know this is just it, it's not going to be something that's very easy to just um you know right. uh, you correct you just fix it right it's not it's not we're not a computer i can't just load a new app and all of a sudden i use pronouns the way i should uh but i i will say almost every trans person i've known and i'm like oh my god i'm so sorry they'll they'll we, you almost always will be okay we you know they will get it like if you're since yeah. it's a sincere effort i've known very few people who are going to be like still pissed Mm. Yeah. You know, if you say, like, one, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. My bad. And double, we get right. Like the, I've never run into a trans person who was a jerk about it. So, so kudos. But, uh, but I, it's definitely one area where I'm like, I need to fix this. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can't just be like, all right, grandpa, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> racist grandpa. Here's Joe. You know, you yeah, can't... I do. Ne- I never want that, that, oh, you know, oh, to somebody oh. tag me that way. And, you know, that's oh. not even where I'm, I'm even close to that. But, you I, know, I, it's, I, these things are changing. You know, yeah, hang around with like 20 something year old women is so hard now. I'm just like, OK, I can't be the creepy dude. Like, yeah. I, you know, right? I just can't. I can't. I don't want to be that guy. So because like sometimes like I'm at like a writer thing and there's like a bunch of like, you know, young women there and i'm like okay i'm gonna be like really like extra careful here because anyway it's all good (laughs) people are sensitive these days and i i have to apologize to all the people because you know i'm generation x i grew up with george carlin um eddie murphy and and um who else? Who's my man? Richard Pryor. Yeah. I'm like these guys <laughs> stepped on lines constantly, and you know, and it was it was a comedy thing as well. But it, they were addressing social issues as well. You know, George Carlin with religion, obviously. Um, Eddie Murphy, Richard Pryor with race. Uh, but <laughs> they didn't care. You know, they they would say whatever was on their mind. Um, and they did not tiptoe. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, I, I picked that up. <laughs> but, you know, we always try to um, at least better ourselves as, as we grow, you know? Try to, yeah. <laughs> try to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's tough now because you can say something just top of, you know, just something just flows and you post it on social media somewhere and, you know, it's... Absolutely. It could be a stupid oh, thing you're saying, like Joe having a, some tequila and he says something silly and and then it's over. <laughs> I got in a couple bangers on Twitter this month. <laughs> <laughs> I've become the drama. Now people are asking for Twitter drama. Like, I'll start something. There's a lot of plotter drama, though, isn't there? I mean, I... I I didn't go, so I've never had Twitter. I did Facebook and then I got BookTube and I was like, you know, all my Facebook friends are people I grew up with. Uh, none of them are huge readers. So I created my Twitter account and I was just like, maybe I'll just get all my writer and reader friends in this area, uh, which is good because there's really not that much drama, uh, but that there also is. And, and you just want to be like, listen, just let it go. You know, you know, the, the main thing is, you know, this person did a disgusting thing. Um, and, you know, we have people that can, you know, that will continue to to bring it up and talk about it. But um, it's, you know, it, it's a decent space, at least in the, in the writing and the reading community from what I've found out. So a substantial number of writers will remain apolitical on Twitter. Not all, but I have not run into too many indie writers who are like uh, posting much about because then that's my thing, and that's my thing about my Facebook page is I will post politics on my Facebook page, so I will not 
friend request anyone in the book community on Facebook. I'm like, if you want to friend me, you can, but that's at your own risk. Cause I may say something about an election and if you don't like it, I understand, but then you can defriend me on Facebook. But Twitter's a very apolitical space and BookTube is a reasonably apolitical space for almost everyone. Almost yeah. to a good point. I, I can confirm that for Joe. I, I did send him a Facebook friend request and he was like, fuck this guy. Uh, he did not respond back. I, I, I'm going to, I'm, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go old school. I'm going to poke that fucker. <laughs> I, them. I just don't send any because I'm like, well, if you're a closet person on the other no. side of the political spectrum from me, we don't, you don't want to be my Facebook friend. It's just going to piss you off. That's all I'm saying to everybody. So that's the you know when we get into politics there is nothing that will turn me off more uh even with writers and um yeah it's a especially in america after these last five years man um uh, uh just the, these last five years has affected me uh just because i thought i knew people uh mm. and it turns out i don't uh, that's just my uh, opinion. Um, but uh, yeah, you really, especially if you're an indie author, like you better not say nothing on social media because that is how you grow. And, you know, the, to get at least from what I see, you know, these authors, they start getting out there and, you know, one person will get there and, and it'll, it'll, it'll start, the snowball will start getting bigger. Um, and there's nothing, you know, unfortunately, you know, I heard about, obviously there's nobody that I've run into like this, but, you know, um, uh, Lovecraft, you know, HG mm -hmm. Lovecraft right? or HP Lovecraft. I didn't know about his backstory. And then, you know, I heard everybody talking about him oh, and yeah. then I, I went and I listened to the book. Uh, and I picked the wrong one because I picked uh, Call of Cthulhu because that was the name I've heard my whole life, Cthulhu, right? And and I get into it where I looked him up and, oh, shit, he doesn't like me because of my religion. Mm -hmm. um, he's long gone, guys. But um, that is – there's no way. I mean, any ism – if you are, have any ism, sexism, racism, uh, and I've run across it, that that's – tattooed in my brain for mm. good and i'm sorry but then i read call of cthulhu and i started reading and boom you know his views you could definitely see are on the page as well um but uh mm. yeah there's nothing that'll turn me off more than if an author has an ism um you know going on that that'll really bother me and i started reading uh call of cthulhu yes it kind of bled into the page and i want to try the mountains of madness is that what it's called mm -hmm. um but i liked his writing but it it was it was bothering me because that is just how i was bred you know i was raised by a feminist hippie uh, a jewish feminist hippie who who, who you know pounded equality into me my whole life mm -hmm. uh i have a photo of my great grandmother i told i told um joe this the other day of, i have a photo of my great grandmother being arrested for opening her jewish bakery on a saturday um so mm -hmm. that's just like it is ingrained in me and it is something that that i can't let go sometimes and i would love to i'm gonna try again with hp lovecraft um, but it is something that will really resonate with me. And uh, your words, unfortunately, may not even matter to me. Yeah, I think they just renamed some trophy. The World Fantasy Award was the Lovecraft. Hmm. Yeah, they changed the name. Oh, that was 2015. Okay. I knew it was something like that. I'm like, I'm trying to remember. And I'm like, I've got a freaking computer right here. I can Google <laughs> this in five seconds. And I did. But uh, yeah, they change it because he was, he was even, he, the funny thing about Lovecraft is like, he wasn't just racist. Everyone in his, every white person in his era was pretty racist by our standards, right? Some people might've been like, well, black people deserve equal opportunities, but they're not going to make as much of them as white people would, but they still deserve them. Like that was the best you were going to get. But he was even racist by like contemporary standards, which is yeah. amazing. 
right? So I'm like, all right, you know, I'm not, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna criticize anyone for reading Lovecraft or liking Lovecraft. It's like, I don't, I haven't read his stuff in a long time, but, but there's a very tricky, like, like a uh, 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 thorny, like little nest of questions around that, right? Like, uh, hmm. you know, do you, do, you, do you, are you gonna, are you gonna, are you gonna, you know, shun the author for for having these views? Or are you gonna not read their stuff? Or are you gonna read their stuff but take it into you know, like maybe look look a little bit down on it because of what they say outside the work. You know, it's all very tricky. I don't have answers. I just have questions. You kind of feel like some authors get a pass, though, right? It's kind of feel like Lovecraft got a pass for a long time. It wasn't exactly a secret. Um, so I wonder why that is. Like, why did he get a pass when other authors were shunned, uh, right or wrong? Um, but Lovecraft seems to have kind of People kind of ignore that. Like, that's, you know, he was a Nazi. That's okay. <laughs> like, he's Lovecraft. It's kind of weird. I don't know. <laughs> Has any, any of you guys read Weave World by Clive Barker? I read uh, Clive Barker. I can't remember if I read that. I went through like a phase where I read a bunch of Clive Barker. But I don't know. Uh, I think he's great. I, at least if I'm on Damnation Game and it, it's, it's up my alley. Um, but yeah. Every time there's a character in Weed World, Weed World called Shadwell, um, and I I like to picture faces in my head, and I don't know why his face was that Lovecraft black and white photo, and it was just mm. perfect. It, it was so the whole time Lovecraft's face is Shadwell for me because he is a villain in the in the story, and it just works so well. You, you know, he was. English. I don't know. If, I don't even know if Lovecraft was English, to be completely honest. But you know, he just it, his face really matched the uh, villain Shadwell in, in Weave World. And if you guys haven't uh, read Weave World, I highly suggest doing so. Hmm, damn it, Lovecraft was American. Oh, yeah. Oh. Okay. Oh. Lovecraft. Yeah. You know either. I just looked it up. <laughs> Good. Thank you for making me feel a little bit better. I appreciate that. No, no, I had no idea. I was wondering myself. Well, it looks like they're actually producing a Weave World TV series. But the oh, I think CW. that might work actually on CW. Oh, never mind. This is this is from 2015. Sorry. <laughs> no, yeah, okay. I guess it didn't work out. <laughs> I like the CW DC shows, like The Flash, Green Arrow, at least early seasons. Some of that was good stuff. The first couple of seasons of Arrow were okay, and then it got a little weird. Repetitive. Yeah. I hate the superhero trope where the all of the villains are just people getting revenge on the heroes. It's like all the things that threaten the city are indirectly caused by the heroes themselves. Like they, they get into that a lot in the Flash and in uh, yeah. Arrow. We're just like every season, it's like the city's in peril because someone wants to blow it up because they're pissed at the Green Arrow. And I'm like, you know, if you guys weren't there, all these people would be a lot safer. And to me, that's the antithesis of what a superhero should be. And it always annoys me. It happens in a suit like Man of Steel, like hmm. the you know, he basically they come to the planet to Earth because of because of Superman, you know? So <laughs> and they made everyone into a hero. Everyone everyone was a hero eventually. Everyone has some kind of superpower. It's like when everyone has it, it's not as it's like they're all superheroes. And then they shouldn't be. And then they're just goofy, yeah. like these yeah. goofy heroes that nobody gives a shit about. Like, I just have the Flash, and then I have his team, and that's good enough. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like the Flash. I've been really disappointed in TV lately. Um, have hmm. you guys watched uh, Blue Eye Samurai? I loved on it on Netflix. Oh, it was so good. So good. It, it, it's the only thing only tv show this year you know one piece is not bad i'm, I'm watching that uh, i didn't read the manga um but um yeah blue-eyed samurai is it is, is exceptional go well, ahead joe what I, do you got well, agree 100 percent. one piece i really like but it's definitely a it's definitely a shonen story right it's like it's it's like got got like a very like four younger audience like a YA type of, but it's really good for that. Like the main character is like, I don't want to say one dimensional, but a little bit like hmm. every like everyone's a little like inflated. Everyone's a little larger than life in their personalities. None of no none of the characters are realistic. They're all bigger, right? Yeah, they're towing this line. 
between absurdity, you know, and, and, and there's a fine line there. And I think um, One Piece live action show is doing a good job of not going overboard because for some, an adult, which these are some adult themes going on within this, you know, book, um, for an adult, nothing will turn me off more than, than going overboard on absurdity. Um, and I think th with the show, they're towing the line very well with it. But they're going there, right? They're in that, they're, they're definitely, it's definitely not like, like a, it's not gritty realistic, right? Everything no. is, is on the, in that direction. It's not too far. I agree with you. And I thought they did a really good job with the show and they really captured the spirit of the manga. And it's not, it's oh, not like a scene for senior production, but it is this. It is the feeling yeah. of, the, of, the, of the moment. I would say the actor that is playing Luffy is so exceptional. Good. I mean, that guy yeah. is killing his role more than anyone else on that screen. And they, whoever cast this person should win an award because, honestly, Luffy's my favorite character. And I really did not think he would be that for me. And um, I went in completely blind. Uh, for whoever doesn't know what Luffy's superpower is, please close your ears. This man stretched for the first time, and I was like, "What the fuck is happening?" I thought that was awesome, and I because I was getting surprised. You know, there are some people who know what's going on, and this is a pirate world. I went in completely blind, and I was actually satisfied with the outcome. I am on episode six or seven right now. I got my wife to watch it. Are you kidding? My wife, any absurdity, she's like, this sucks. And she's like, this is kind of funny. Um, I can rock with this. Last night, I'm reading um, Something Wicked This Way Comes, oh, right. and I Oh my God! Don't don't get me started on that book. We don't have enough goddamn time. Um, and I turned over to my wife and was like, "Dude, you want to watch One Piece?" She's like, "Yeah." I I was shocked. I was like, "All right," and like we put it on, and uh, we're episode we're in episode six, and it, you know, we're we're taking it as it comes. We understand that it's an absurd world. It's um, mm -hmm. a magical world. Um, my interest is how these people are going to pull it off uh, because this is a mon This is not something easy to pull off. Your camera angles have to be exceptional. And unfortunately, I think they're doing some of these younger actors a disservice by their camera angles um, because mm -hmm. some of these young actors are not hitting it. Um, but if they got them in a different way, I think they might've done a little better. Um, but yeah, the, the show as a whole, uh, I was actually a quite impressed with it. That's really good. I watched Yu Yu Hakusho this week, the live action remake, and I would recommend it if you were a diehard fan of the anime and nobody else. What was it? I'm sorry, I missed it. Yu Yu Hakusho. So, uh, you, uh Haka? it's from the guy who did Hunter x Hunter, but he did it before. Uh, uh, and it was one of the, it was an anime that was popular and making the rounds when Dragon, it's before your time, but when Dragon Ball was first making the rounds in the anime community here in the U.S., it's another like tournament fighting, like high, high energy, you know, high magic martial art type of story. And if you love the anime, you're going to love the live action show. But if you didn't care about the anime, don't watch it. It wasn't that good. You said before my time, but I'm a I'm a fist of the North Star fan, my man. Wouldn't, isn't that like one of the first ones? Am I right or no? That's early. That's early. That's early. That's, early. That, that, that's like the beginning right there, I thought. You know? I watched a whole bunch of those not too long ago, and it's like, oh, it's so bad. It's so bad. This is the North well, Star. When you first experienced it, when we were whatever age we were then, it, it was something new. You're just like, martial arts for 20 years. I always wanted to find a move where I could walk away and go, you're already dead and have a little timer. 10, 9, nine <laughs> I blow up when I was done. Never learned it. I kept asking all my teachers, when do I learn that technique? The uh, Like the one in Kill Bill, huh, at the end? Hmm. <laughs> Three steps. Three, that's it. Oh, God, what a great. What a great freaking movie. Delay, delayed Death Touch is so is such a good literary uh, yeah. uh, move. Uh, yeah, three steps. You have so much time to talk about those three steps and put have, good have, stuff. 
I haven't yeah. done one of those in any of my books. Now I'm now I'm upset at myself. I've never put in a delayed death touch thing. I, mean, I got to figure. I, I want to give you my uh, thought on the Grim Dwarf uh, uh, thing. I wanted to write, but I am not a writer, Joe. But you had me. You're like, dude, go go submit it. That night, my wife is like, what have you been doing? I'm just over there talking to myself because I don't know why. I just sit there and I mumble to myself, like my story the whole time as I'm thinking about what, the, you know, the Grim Dwarf and, and my just, savage story right, I had. I'll put it in there and then, um, you know, you don't lose the rights. You can use it for something else. Oh, I don't. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, listen, I, I, I the, you know what? the anthology, right? You can do whatever you want. I've never, I've written a, a a, a school note that that is the extent of my <laughs> writing experience. Um, you know, when someone parks badly, right? You can't yeah. <laughs> though, <laughs> you know, though, you know, my past um, relationships, th they'll tell you I had a way with words, but uh, we won't get into that now. Okay. <laughs> because I, I am definitely a married man and uh, we won't talk about, what a ladies man and, and what a swab talker I was back in the day. <laughs> I put all my swab talking in the books. That's, that's yeah. That's what I'm going to, you know what? I, I, I loved entering this community because at least it, it is making me think about, I have a story mm -hmm. in my head. Uh, but for me, I want to go to school. Uh, I'd rather, go back um, and learn, you know, maybe English 101, whatever it is, but, uh, you know, go back and learn the, um, you know, <laughs> try to learn structure and tone, character work, things like that. Watch Sanderson's lectures on YouTube. It's a really good start. I will do, you know what, I'm going to do that. You know, you know what I'm talking about, the, the, the Brandon Sanderson does the, his course on writing genre fiction. He basically recorded it one or at least one year and just puts on you put it on youtube like every lecture front to back and i'm yeah, not it always it always comes up in my uh suggestion I, feed i i can't recommend those highly enough because they're very basic but they and he's got a really i love the way he thinks about writing because for sanderson it's never this is how to do it it's always okay if you do this you gain x and you lose y like if you have one POV, you gain this, but you lose this. If you have first person, you gain something, but you lose. And he's always thinking about it in terms of the trade-off. So for the story you want to write, it's not one answer, but it's if you do it in this POV, if you do it in this tense, if you use this kind of start send structure, you're going to gain this, but lose that, you know. The, and, and that's the way you have to think about writing. You can't think about the right way to do it. You can think of your right way, but, but you have to – you know, there's no one answer, right? There's lots of mm. people love all kinds of different books, but the choices you make are gonna are gonna come with prices, and they're gonna bring you. You know, so 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 you watch his stuff, and it's it's it's, and he's thought about this a lot. He's thought about people who write differently than him, and he's not just a guy who only thinks about how do I make the best Brandon Sanderson book. Clearly, he has, but he's also thought a lot about how do other people write? How is it different? And I and he can talk to those people and make like meaningful sentences, you know. So uh, I love those lectures. Many of you, because I I don't have time to go back to school. Well, when I started writing, I have a full time job and kids and you know yeah stuff. I wasn't gonna go back to college like I was just never on the on the table. But I could watch those videos. Hmm. And the first like six seasons of writing excuses are really worth listening to. When Sanderson was the host and um, Dan, Dan Wells and um, Taylor, I forgot Taylor's first name. The, the cartoonist who was on Writing Excuses, he was like the, the their friend and like the and then the third host and they got Mary Rabbit a Kowal to host co-host. Those first six or eight seasons of that podcast are amazing and they're short of like fifteen minute episodes. They just punch mm -hmm. a topic. Um, huge amount of value in that. Then it got a little repetitive, and the later stuff isn't as good. But anyway, hmm. and it's free. Like that's the thing. Like people, like I know a lot of people. Are like, well, I don't want to invest a ton of money in doing that. You know, and, although every indie author I know seems to be like deeply in the red. Not every of them, but a lot of us. So that's another side of it. You know what was really interesting that came up on a YouTube commercial was that masterclass. 
uh, I saw a writer, you know, talking about their experience and what, you know, how they write. Uh, I, I caught one for free. Um, I want to say it might have been uh, Atwood, um, but she just, it was so cool to, to, to hear her speak about writing. Um, and then I was like, oh, I'm going to go sign up. And they're like, oh, you need to pay money. I'm like, fuck you, master class. Seriously. <laughs> like, why'd you do that? Why'd you give me a clip of this writer telling amazing stories about what got her into writing and how she does this and that? And then all of a sudden, nah, you, you need money, bud. Give me a credit card. Fuck out of here. Just let me give me her secrets, damn it. You know, but, you know, I. <laughs> They they charge for everything these days. I had to buy fucking an extra McDonald's barbecue sauce the other day for 75 cents. They said 75 cents. I said, screw you. I, I'll go home and crack open the um, the Ray's, the Ray's barbecue sauce. Then. Oh, nice. It's good stuff. <laughs> 75 cents for barbecue sauce. Yeah, it was, it was fucking ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Wow. Maybe it was 35 cents. I like to over exaggerate to make it funnier. <laughs> but still, 35. I bought 20 nuggies, bro. Did you just give me two sauces for 20 nuggies? Like, look at look oh. at my stomach. Obviously, I like a lot of sauce. And, you know, I don't know. <laughs> that is harsh. That's rough. That's, that's rough. That is not okay. It is not. <laughs> it is not okay. Okay. So, Joe, for for someone who who comes to you and says, "I, I really want to publish a book," um, how much money should I have ready to invest in a book? Get for a decent cover, for a, a decent editor, top to bottom. What would you tell them? How much do they have in hand, ready to spend to do that? If you want to be competitive, okay. There's all different corners of the indie market. So the part of the indie market that I know is what I call the Spiffbo corner, right. uh, which is like the people who enter Spiffbo, the people who the booktubers talk about. If you look at like the top 10 lists, you have like um, it's, you have the people who are Spiffbo finalists and semifinalists, their community, all their own. They're hitting a certain market. They're typically not writing 10 books a year. Right. They're they're they're, they're um, it, it's a corner and it's not the most lucrative corner of the market. Right? The military sci fi people who release 10 books a year have never heard of Spiffbo and they're making a lot more money, right? That's a whole different deal. And I don't know how their stuff works, but if you want to enter, like a, if you want a book that you want to make a splash in the Spiffbo world, I say Spiffbo just because it's like, these are the people who tend to enter that contest or there, or the judges, like the, the Spiffbo judges know who they are, hmm. right? They, they, that's who we're, 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 we're trying to hit up. And that's the crowd I ended up in uh, almost by accident. I love those people. I, I'm not complaining. Um, if you want to make a splash in that market, I'm going to say you're best off at eight grand up front. That does not count advertising. Wow. Okay, two, two to three for a, for a cover that people will remember, which means it's like a Felix Ortiz or a handful of others. You can do better. Right. Partial function had like a thousand dollar cover, uh, uh, which people loved, but those Felix Ortiz and people will pick up that book because of the cover. And that's a cup, two or three. I don't know what he charges, but it's like two or three grand. Um, and then for editing, that's another two grand. You can, you can you can go higher, but that's assuming you're doing your own dev editing with your friends. And then you really want an audiobook. And it's got to be decent because a lot of the the whale re- the a lot of the the influencers in the community are whale readers, but they read a lot and they do it with audio. So a lot of the big influencers, if you want to get on their list and you're an unknown, see, I'm not trying to, I'm, it's going to sound like I'm a shitty person. I'm not trying to brag. I'm saying like, I can reach out to people who have booktube channels and say, I've got a new book coming out. And a lot of them will say, well, send it to me. I will read it soon because the, I have, they've read four books of mine already or five books of mine already. Right? I have a reputation, right. but I couldn't do that a year ago or a year and a half ago. Right. So if you're new, you don't have that. You don't have people who answer your DM. Um, an audio will really help you jump the list because they're going to have a certain number of books they list, they, they, they listen to and a certain number of books they read physically or on Kindle, you know, physically just means either, either you know, on the, on their, the print. And um, if you have audio, you're going to jump lists. Uh, audio got me into so hmm. many hands of so it didn't make me any money, 
but it got me onto a ton of people's uh, like booktubers um, and reviewers and bookfluencers, I call them. You know, the people the people like like Bo Kelly. Bo Kelly doesn't actually have like a like a um he doesn't have like a uh uh a YouTube uh, channel, I know that YouTube channel, he doesn't I th he reviews on like Goodreads, but he doesn't have like a blog, but he has a Discord. Yeah. But mm -hmm. he, he's not even the sole owner of that Discord, right? I'm on that Discord. I'm on there all the time. But I, it's not just his. He, he does a lot of the work. Yeah. But it's not just his. Yes. But yes. here's the thing. Mm -hmm. If Bo Kelly reads your book and likes it, he'll talk to a bunch of other people. And some of those people do have platforms. So, like, he's like, the people like that. So, I don't know what the – there's no one word for those people. But the people who know the people. How much do I depend on beta readers for dev editing? A ton. A ton. So I'll make an outline. I'll make an, uh, uh, um, um, a rough draft. My rough drafts are very clean now. So they're almost done when I finish it. And then I'll send it to beta readers and they'll help me fix things. But it's almost always, rel it's always, always tone. Like, I don't really get why this person did this in this scene. I'm like, okay, I need to add like one sentence where they go, oh, I, I know how to f beat the bad guy. We just have to get that statue or whatever. Um, so the, the number of changes I'll make after my beta readers are small, but that's a huge amount of it. I don't hire a, um, I don't hire a, a dev editor. I, I trust myself and my beta readers between us to come up with, uh, with that stuff. I do hire a line editor and a proofreader because that I do not trust any of us. And you learn that by hiring one and then you go, oh my God, there's a mistake on every page after I read it 12 times. How did that? Ha how how is that even possible? And yet it is. Hmm. So uh, I, I'm a big believer in a line editor and a and a, and a, and a, and a, and a good proofreader. Between those, they'll help you catch all your um, mistakes. But I, and I I, I hired uh, I'm I'm paying Sarah Char now to help me do series level dev editing dev editing on the hybrid helix because at book five I want to make sure I'm not introducing changes too quickly. And at book five I started going I'm not sure I'm I can do this because. There's literally no one else in the world who knows the story except for me and Sarah who knows what I'm trying to like get with it because there's a storyline, but it's like, I have to dribble it because it's a series of standalones. So I was like, at some point I, I, after writing book four, I was like, I need help because <laughs> I wanted ideas for book five. So I did, I am paying Sarah to help me with a very big picture view. So I was like, please read the first four. And then this is my rough plan for book five. And you tell me if I'm being stupid. <laughs> and Melissa just told me I wasn't being stupid. We'll see if I can pull it off. Yeah. But it's always tricky with a series because you don't want to, you don't want to rewrite the first book over and over again. But, um, you know, if you change too much, then it's different. And your readers who love book one are going to be like, well, I don't like this anymore. Because you change too much. So you got to toe the line or just say, screw them. So that's going to be tough though, right? To, to hook somebody in your series and then want to take it, want to kind of make a, take a turn and take it a slightly different direction. Do you worry about that, about losing fans of the series? Cause you've changed or you. Yeah. But you start off with one with this guy who's like a retired, you know, military dude who just wants to be left alone and live a quiet life. But I'm not going to write 25 books about a guy who just wants to be left alone and live a quiet life. At some point he's going to say, Things there needs to be okay. conflict. Huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Things aren't there okay. There needs to be a conflict. Yeah. It's not just that, but the conflict can't always come to him. I can't do a monster of the, of the, of the week where every every book something comes to the station and he's got to he's got to f it up to like save everybody. Like that to me doesn't ring true. I'm like at some point he's gonna be like, why do we live in a world where I, I've had ten straight books where monsters come to f up all my friends? I've got to do something to change the global picture because that's the guy he is. So he's going to have to start being proactive and start gathering resources and taking a proactive approach to this stuff. Like this scenario is creating problems. Again, after 10 books or five books or whatever, it's like, I need to fix the situation. So, I mean, it's still the same guy. It's just a guy who has, has gone from having sort of given up in the face of this overwhelming, you know, sort of difficult situation saying, I'm going to change the situation. I'm not just going to run. I'm going to stick my heels in and go for it. And that's a switch. You know, there are people who call Wistful sending a slice of life book. And I'm like, I'm not going to keep up slice of life, life for, for 20 books. Like, I can't. <coughs> like that doesn't, that doesn't appeal to me. 
I might sell better. <laughs> like, like that's the thing, right? I went risk ascending in book, book two. I could have had the same set of characters and the same stuff happening in the same place. And just something else comes to the station and he has to deal with it. I could have made the second book that book. And I didn't. Instead, I took him away from all the friends and all the people everyone loved, put him on Earth so we could explore a different corner of the, of the setting. And, you know, was that a risk? Yeah, it was a risk. A lot of people didn't like that. But, you know, the, the, the trick is if after 12 books are out, people go, oh, that was great. You know, you don't, you don't get an answer to whether that was worth it now. You get it when you're on, like, the Dresden Files, when you're on book 17, and people are like, that thing he did in book four was really great, right? That's, that's the goal. Wow. Book 17. I, I mean, I, I, def, I, mean, I don't have a, a strict number for the hybrid. I've been telling people 25 books. I don't know if I'm going to hit 25 books. But I have a storyline, and I have an end, and it's going to be a lot. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not getting there in book eight. I can tell you that for sure, because I know what has to happen between now and then, and it's not going to fit. So, yeah, yeah, that was always the plan. It's crazy, and that's that's the other beautiful thing about indie publishing, is you can't go to tour or orbit with that plan. They will not publish you. You know, like like Jim Butcher could do it now, right? Like like Stephen King could say, "I want to publish a twenty book series." They'd be like, "Yes, sir," right? But like, no new writer can go to like orbit and say. I want to publish a 20 book series. They're going to, they're going to laugh. You know, it'll never happen. But India, I can do whatever the hell I want. As long as I keep paying cover artists and keep putting books on Amazon. Yeah. One of the things I hear is a, like the, a big pain in the ass is formatting. Is formatting difficult? Um, if you have a picture book, then yes. So if anyone wants to write a, like a, like a book, my books are just text, right? And then if you get a, and then you got to do two things. One is you've got to go to a use software. Um, you've got to pay. There's two that are popular. One is called Atticus. It's web-based. Anyone can use it. One is called Bellum, which I believe is Mac only. They're both under $200 to buy. It's not even an annual fee, I think. At least I'm not sure about Bellum. Atticus is a one-time fee. It's like 150 bucks. Super easy to use. You write your stuff up, make it a Word document, import it, and all the formatting is ridiculously easy. Hmm. And then you need to talk to someone about your your, your, your basics because if you're someone like me, I don't know what font size is legible. And most of these programs don't tell you, look, just use, you know, this font, use like 1.4, use this line spacing, you know, 11 point, and it's going to look good. Like they won't give you that. Right. So you've got to find someone who will tell you, start with this. And then if you don't like it, adjust it a little bit up, up or down. And then you can print stuff out in a PDF and you actually put it 100 percent on your computer screen and you hold an actual book up next to it and you squint real hard. And can I read this on my screen? Because you don't have to actually print the book. And I spent quite a bit of time figuring that out the first time. But once you figure it out, it's real easy. Like I use all the same settings now. So, um, uh, it, it, but you have to use that kind of stuff. If you try to use it, if you try to save the money and do it from a Word file, it's a lot of hours of like putting in page breaks and getting your chapter titles to look right before to look good on Kindle. I mean, not, not I mean, like you look good in print. Hmm. Use a, a software Atticus or Vellum. Both are very popular. They're both very easy. And I'm not a graphic designer. I mean, I definitely hired someone to do my covers. Yeah. Right. And it was like, I wasn't gonna even try. I know people who do do, do it on their own and they're good at it, that's great, but I'll, I wasn't gonna spend, I don't know how many hours it would take to make a serviceable cover. Hmm. I'm trying to be a better writer. I don't yeah. have time to learn art. You know, when not- did uh, the idea of Hybrid Helix and Rohan come to you? <laughs> there you go. Oh, Invincible. Invincible. Okay. Oh, good. So you read that, and all of a sudden, a just story started blossoming in your head, or? So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, um, <coughs> I write out of spite. Okay, that's what motivates me. Um, so I'll read something. I'm like, this is really cool. It's that there's something that they did that's like, in my that doesn't work for me. It's like, in my opinion, a mistake. Maybe mistake's not the right word. It doesn't work for me. Like there's something missing 
And I go, it would be better if, and that's how I write all my stories. So there's a particular plot twist in Invincible towards the end. So I don't want to tell people what it was because I'm ruining the storyline, which hopefully people are reading. The particular t- plot twist that annoyed me is I felt like there was this way of gaining power that someone else should have used earlier on and no one ever did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's hey, guys. Story. <laughs> hey guys, I got to, uh, I got to go. Um, I got to get back to work. Okay. Um, I really appreciate you having me on Steve, Joe, always a pleasure. I hope we get, uh, can get together again. Mm. Guys, go check out Joe's books, man. Um, Joe mm. actually reached out to me on my channel. He, he took a risk because he saw somebody that probably doesn't, would might not, might not like what he wrote and what he writes. He reached out to me and he's like, listen, I want to get your view on this because you're kind of the guy that I think it might not land with and I want to see what you think. Hmm. And, uh, he, you know, he, he, he reached out to me, he sent it and I got on it and good thing he had an audio because I, I, I kind of, I'm getting into immersive reading now and man, what I, I hate to keep saying fun, uh, because it was definitely, <laughs> it was definitely that, but it, it, there's, there's deeper things going on. I, I loved his character work. I, you know, and I'm enjoying the story and, uh, if you're on a diet, don't read that book, okay? Because food. his his food descriptions are excellent. Say hi, wife. Hi, this is my wife, Kelly. Hi. All right, I'm going to get her to read your books, too. We'll see what she thinks. Um, but uh, I got to get back to work, gentlemen. Thanks for having me. Yo, Steve, congrats on uh, 100 uh, episodes. You were one of the first uh, BookTube channels to reach out to me and ask me to be on your show. Uh, I will always remember that, and I do appreciate it, man. Thank you. Well, we'll be here for another five hours, so if you want to pop back in. Oh, good. Yeah, I might come back. We'll we'll see. I only got two more hours of work. I'm going to beg them to let me out early. They're going to be like, you didn't do work all day. You've been out all day. But anyway, uh, let me get going, guys. You uh, you have a wonderful new year if we don't uh, touch base uh, before. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. You too. Have a good one, Dan. Bye, guys. Take it easy. Oh, Paramita, sir. Hey, Paramita. Hello. Can you hear me? You can. Okay. Glad you could hop on. Yes. I'm awake. So I was like, and I was listening to the YouTube. I mean, I was listening to it on YouTube. So I was like, might as well join in. Oh, nice. I'm glad you can make it. Uh, we were just talking to Joe about, well, about publishing and uh, all the pitfalls, but I was curious, uh, Joe, what do you, if someone if someone asks you, do I need social media to sell books? And if I don't, then how do I find an audience? I guess is is social media necessary? Is it one of those things that you just have to do, or is it an option? Are there other ways to to find an audience without social media? All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna okay. I started selling books when I started getting like booktube action. Like I've had a number of book reviewers mention my books and that definitely pumped my sales up to where I was earning a certain amount every month. But I made a much bigger leap when I started running Amazon ads. Hmm. So it's hard to say. Um, You need a way for people to find your books. Mm -hmm. So I think if you had a really good cover and pitch that might be good enough with good, clever ad work. You're going to have to know what you were doing. I don't know how you would learn what you were doing if you didn't already know what you were doing. Right? Like, I mean, if you, if you know, like the, who are the people who are very successful? I like think people who have, you have, you have some kind of audience, right? Like that, yeah. that, and there's all different kinds of ways to do that. Like, uh, like how did Larry Curry become, uh, become a big, a, a big name, right? I think he was active in like the, and like the gun forums, like about like firearms stuff, hmm. like that was his. And so he had a whole bunch of people who knew him from people who discussed guns, you know, because he's a gun guy, which is not my thing. I mean, I, nothing but respect for gun people, right? Like that, that, that's a hobby I'd be into if I lived somewhere else. Yeah. Like I just don't live in an area conducive to shooting a lot, but I, I, I did as a kid. I love guns. Anyway, point is, you know, so he had a built-in audience, right? So he started writing books about people killing monsters with guns, and they're like, hey, Larry wrote a book. So that was a, that was how he got his start, my understanding, and you need something like that. 
Hmm. So I don't know if it has to be social media. You might be able to get away without it. But like when I see the writers, who's the guy? Uh, I think we were, were we talking about Nomads of the Sea? Was yeah. That yeah, I have his name pinned somewhere. I uh, forget his name, but yeah, he kind of he didn't there. have yeah didn't have much of a, of a presence. I can't see that he's very active anywhere on social media that I've noticed. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know anything about. I think it's a man. I think uh, I think it's a guy. Uh, I'm not even sure about that. But um, you know, the, the book's not getting a ton of traction. Hmm. And I think and I, maybe they're. I don't know if they're running ads or not. But you can see, like that book was getting like. Some people who really like Wistful Ascending also really like that book. At around the same time, both got reviewed by like Andrews Wizardly Reads. And then now, you know, that the, that book didn't take off. And I have to assume, uh, now if that person had a really good like ad campaign, that might have been good enough. But I think you would need like a really good cover, really good pitch, and really good ad game. You could probably do without social media, but you need one of those. Like hmm. either those things, you know, there's some books that just pitch well. You know, like in one sense, everyone's like, oh, that sounds great. Like, I don't think Whistle Ascending is one of them, but like my favorite example is um, Gideon the Ninth. Oh, yeah. Right. Lesbian Necromancers in Space. Something about that, people just like, oh, oh, what? And they want to read it. You know, like that sells so many books that four, and it's also a great book. Like, if it was a crappy book, it wouldn't have done well. But man, that pitch, hmm. that's gold. You know, that's just, I don't even know. That's what I tried to do with Partial Function. I tried to make a really pitchable book, hmm. which so far hasn't worked, but that's okay. For, well, I guess for the investment in Amazon ads, is, it, is there a return on your investment for the amount you spend? Is it worth it? I mean, I've never lost money on a day. Or maybe once. Wow. Uh, I've been running ads this whole year. I started January 1st, 2023. And I've never had a losing day. I've had days where the bulk of my revenue was paid out in ad money. Like maybe I made 10 bucks and I spent nine. You know, I've had days like that. But I don't think I've lost money on a day. Not that I've noticed. So if it's happened, it's been rare. Um, but I definitely... Saw, and it's weird. Like Amazon will tell you, oh, you got this many clicks and had this many sales from your ads. But then your your actual sales go up. Your revenue goes up more than you would think. So something's wonky in there that I can't quite figure out. But when I started spending a lot of money on ads, I started getting a lot more sales. Hmm. And I have not figured out the, how the whole thing works yet. Like I've been playing with it all year and it's definitely not, I have not figured it out. The problem with ads though is you really can't, you, you generally, the, the general feeling is you can't really make money on ads with one book. Hmm. Right. Like, you know, in theory, if someone, you know, if I run an ad and I get a sale, it could turn into four sales or five sales. That's where I make my money. I never make money on Wistful Ascending. I charge 99 cents for the ebook. Yeah. Uh, but I made a lot of money on KU and a lot of money on, uh, since I started running Amazon ads hmm. and the ads seem to spike a, a, a jump. Like my sales went up like, a lot when I first started running ads and then it, it, it plateaued, it, it, dro it dropped steeply after the whole year, big spike when I started running ads and then it all tailed off. So it might be a way to write new ads that everything stays high. I don't know what that is yet. Hmm. Excuse me. That was my experience. <laughs> uh, pardon me. Where, where do you find books that you're, uh, I guess, newer books, where do, where do you find them? Where do you find the most success finding what you enjoy? Hmm. Asking people on Discord is probably, or mm. on page viewing, I mean, it's probably the most successful. Other than that, usually Reddit. Oh. If you can be, if you're like, if you're like one of the people on our fantasy that people trust, you can make a career. Right. So you ask about social media, like if you just know that person, you can make a, a writing career out of that. If you um, if you can get your book in like Petra Leo's TBR, you can make a career out of that. Wow. Yeah. That's why I've had my books on his. I sent books to Indonesia. They've been sitting on a shelf for uh, for a year now. I keep hoping 
Come on, Patrick. <laughs> read them. <laughs> Well, there's different kinds of reviewers, right? There's some where I want them to read them because I like the reviewer, and there's some where I think the reviewer will really like my books, and it's not the same. It's not the same set. I got, Dan was the same, right? I sent him a book. I actually didn't think I was going to be Dan's favorite book. Yeah. Based on his taste, like I just didn't think I was going to. I don't like Dan. I'm like, yeah, what the hell? I'll send him a book. I, but you know, then there's people where I think they really like, like you know, hmm. they really like it. So <laughs> it's a different thing. Like, you know, anyone who's really into, like, a lot of shonen and manga, I'm like, please read my book, because I think you'll appreciate some of the stuff that's going on in there. Hmm. Wow, yeah. What what subreddits do you find uh, the most success on? Is it our fantasy, Parmita? Uh, our fantasy is uh, helpful, but, like, I run the search through Google, and that gives me, like, older threads on our fantasy. Mm. I, I should clarify that even in fantasy and science fiction, 75 to 80% of the works that I read, the authors are dead. So, Yeah, that's true. It's, it's old, old stuff. <laughs> it's old, old stuff. So our fantasy, sometimes our suggest me a book is good. Sometimes it can go really off. Our print SF is not bad for science fiction. Our weird lit is good for weird fiction sometimes. Hmm. And then classic, I mostly get from r slash literature or r slash true lit which are can be very snobby but uh there are people who know what they're talking about what was the one after help you. Literature? sorry what was the one after our literature r slash true lit true lit thank true you lit. i missed that sorry so th those are the good ones our fantasy is the one i check almost daily because there will be even if it's not for recommendations there will be some post and then if you scroll down the one with the lowest down i mean lowest upwards sorry sometimes will be a book which sounds interesting and so then i look it up and try to read it like our fantasy is a good place you just have to like move to like not the what do i say the top threads and uh, mm. like you have to get over that thing that uh, Stormlight, Malazan, and First Law will get recommended, no matter what your prompt is. So once you get over that, then uh, the little bit more offbeat recommendations will come at the bottom. <laughs> That's interesting. O overall, would you say that Reddit is a good, generally a good place for readers to find recommendations? It has been when I did not have any community participation, like I did not have any Discord or didn't know about BookTube. Reddit was the main place where I found recommendations like hmm. uh, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell or okay. even the Books of Babel. That was actually, that was, I think, a Reddit darling because Mark Lawrence promoted it so much and uh, Josiah Bancroft was active at that time. So, yeah, I think Reddit is actually most helpful if you search through google and if you have a bit of patience and you know keep tailoring the key keywords reddit is actually most helpful for finding recommendations especially if you do prompts like for example today i was searching authors like borges like the main google page will give you very very dodgy recommendations they'll push gabriel garcia marquez and i'm like no that's 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 not right but in Reddit, you'll have a bit more thoughtful, like, I'm suggesting this book, not because it is like Borges, but it gives the same vibe as this story that Borges wrote. And those kind of thoughtful posts will be there I by some Borges. posters. Borges he's, he's, yeah, he's, he, I, I, uh, I mean, I, ma I made up the statement uh, where I say that one does not, it, it's inspired by Nabokov, where uh, I said that one does not read Tolkien, one just rereads Tolkien. And when I uh, read Borges this year, uh, I finally finished the completed, uh, the collected fictions, and then I read the select nonfiction. I kind of feel the same way about him. Like one does not read Borges, one just rereads Borges. He he just he he he's percolating slowly and very very quietly with his little little thought experiments and he's not leaving my mind which is a very very beautiful feeling to have as a reader 
Yeah. Books that require some reflection to appreciate. Yeah. And he, he, he does not, uh, uh, I don't think there's, a, I, at least I did not find any bombast in his language. It's a very, very direct language. Here's a thought experiment. Here's an interesting character sketch. So it's, it's quite, um, quite marvelous how much he can achieve in, with such brevity. Speaking of uh, things you've been reading, uh, mm -hmm. I guess it's a good time to bring it up or to ask you, but uh, Paramita started reading Berserk over the holidays. Wanted to get your thoughts because uh, Joe and uh, you know reads with us, and he's uh, he's been reading for a long time. Uh, so, <laughs> what what were your what are your because th I'm really surprised. Uh, and... I am as surprised as anyone else. Uh, I'm I was speaking to this person on Discord and we were talking in DMs and he mentioned Tolkien as an all-time favorite. And some, when someone mentioned... <laughs> the toys? Don't open it, Joe. Don't open those toys. <laughs> those berserk toys. When someone, uh, when someone says Tolkien is their all-time favorite, when they talk about not just uh, Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, but the Cimmerillion and the Mythos, so in, immediately I'm interested. And then they said that along with Tolkien and some other uh, things that they mentioned, like Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft, Love, H.P. Lovecraft and uh, Conan, uh, I think Dune and Elric, the bottom shelf, they, they shared their bookshelves and they were like, it was full of the buzzer, the hardcover deluxe volume. Mm. And uh, so I asked this person in DM, I said that, uh, you see, you, you are espousing a philosophy which uh, at least Tokian, it's all about doing good to the best that you can, at least in my reading of Tokian. So how do you reconcile that with loving Berserk so much, which I have been told by multiple people is the grim darkest of grim dark things. And this person said that the people who are saying that it is grim dark have either not read Berserk or not understood it because, and he, he didn't say this in any sort of condescending manner. He said that Berserk is noble dark, which means that while grim things happen throughout the story and it is terrifying at times, the sense of striving against that to do something, to fight, to resist is actually quite ennobling. And that's where he said uh, this perception of noble dark came from. And, I mean, I must admit that of all the manga that I have uh, ever heard about, the one that I have gravitated towards most is Berserk. And the only reason I never picked it up is because I didn't like First Law. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like Prince of Nothing. And people have pitched, pitched Berserk as like tougher version, like the darkest thing you can imagine. Hmm. But anyway, I, I went in with an open mind and honestly, uh, volume one was all right, but even by the end of volume one, I can tell. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I hope it's not a spoiler just to mention the main uh, one of the main protagonists named Guts. Uh, he, he, he's not, a, he, he, it's not grim dark. Like, if, if you've read Elric, then I have read Elric, so it's not grim dark. He's, he's, he's a deeply troubled soul, but he's fighting against himself to not give in to those inner demons throughout. Like even at the end of volume one, you can see that. So I was, uh, by volume two, I was hooked. But now the fun part is because I have zero self-control. <laughs> I started on Christmas, I think. And by middle of 27th December, I was done. Wow. I could not put it down. Like. <laughs> this person, <laughs> there were some people on Discord who were like, "What are you doing? Who better is Parmita?" And it's like you cannot put this down. Like you cannot put this down. Uh, beyond, uh, I will say the storytelling and the character arcs, which are very nice. Just the artwork, ah, it's um, in in um, I used to watch this reality show in a very old season in which one person, one of the judges, he listened to this child's performance or an audition and he said, 
uh, I will speak in Hindi and then I will give you the translation. So he said, Gana wo, wo nahi hai jisko de man, 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 jisko sunkar wah nikle. Gana wo hai jisko sunkar ah nikle. So Gana means mu- song. He said, a song is not one which will elicit the reaction, wow. A song which is truly great is the one which will elicit the reaction, ah. Like seeing this, my life is complete or listening to this, my life is different now. So that is what Berserk elicited from me, Miura's art in those panels. It's like, wow is almost like a, you know, like a sort of pat for for somebody who is a maestro. Like you don't do that. I feel like that is almost disrespectful. I don't have the words to express how someone can accomplish this level of detail in some of the panels that he made. It's whether it's golden age, whether it's conviction arc, whether it's millennium falcon. And every time in like, you know, in the beginning of millennium falcon arc, I was feeling, uh, okay, it's going to, you know, slog a bit. He would immediately bring it back, not in the next volume, within the next few panels. Hmm. So I, I was just uh, mesmerized, mesmerized. Wow. He was like shocked. He was like, is this Parami? <laughs> no, I'm surprised that you flew through it that fast. I, I guess it's, I guess when you compare, uh, you know, like word counts and it's not that much. I mean, um, you can spend a lot of time on the, on the art, but you don't really have to. Um... I want to, I want to, like when I reread it, one of the things I'm really looking forward to is, you know, spending my time with the panels and appreciating all the details. But here it was more like, ah, what happens? Oh, what happens? And, uh, uh, sorry, where are you in the read-along, Steve and... Uh, 30? 31? Something like okay, that. So I need to be careful. So, uh, I, I think you know this, that uh, volume 41 was the last Miura was able to pen before his tragic demise. So, when I reached the end of the pa- that panel, I won't talk about the panel that you will see. But then there was a note that, you know, thank you for all the messages and everything. And thank you for being with all of us for all this while. And uh, so I read that note and then I went back to the panel and then again went back to the note. And uh, I, I just choked up because uh, it, it, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Uh, I don't know uh, how you will feel when you reach that point, but it is... Uh, Obviously, I don't think Muria, Muria knew that he was going to, his life was going to be cut short so tragically. But, uh, you know, artists are prescient. I don't know. They have some vision. Uh, what a finale to go out on. Hmm. <laughs> well, Joe, you, you recently reread, you, you read the rest, right? So you're... Yeah, when we got to like 25 or so, I gave up and I reread the ending. Through through to the whatever's been, been published, I think I think you can see it as being grimdark if you only read the first eighteen volumes. Like if you read it only through the eclipse, there aren't a lot of characters who are clearly heroic. Pretty much everyone is terrible. Pretty much, right? No. In, in the first eighteen. Think about Puck. Like every time Guts wants to give in to the darkness, there's Puck. And Puck is delightful. I don't know if Puck is enough to make it not grimdark. Especially because in the first and, 18 volumes, he's only in three of them. He's only in yeah, the first. I mean, and I mean, there's Casca, there's Judea. I don't even know how I'm pronouncing their names. And they all end up There's in, Rickard. And they don't, things don't work. Yeah, okay, go, that's... That's kind of true, except they're also all hired killers. Yeah, uh, then, I guess, I mean, this goes to the heart of the question. None of them are what we would consider classically good characters, right? None of them are acting to make the world a better place. They're hired mercenaries who are happy to go out and kill other people for money, and they're good to their friends. But I would count any of them as morally gray at best. None of them are like, I'm going to make the world a better place. They're all like, I'm going to kill that guy so I can get gold in my pocket. They're nice to each other, so we like them, but I wouldn't call them heroic. And Guts is very much um, portrayed in a mixed way in those first 18 volumes. 
And most we can say he's he wants to kill the bad guys because he's angry at them. But doesn't seem particularly concerned about protecting the innocent either in those first 18 volumes, like through the eclipse. But then after that is when we start getting more legitimately heroic, in the traditional sense, heroic characters. who are trying to make things better. I don't want to spoil too much. Mm. Yeah, but, like I'm, I'm very aware of the fact that uh, they, uh, Steve is uh, on this journey. And so, the, I mean, part of the magic is uh, experiencing the journey on its own. But Steve knows Shirky and... Even stupid Isidro is a decent guy at his heart. heart. I love it. You know, so he's he's, he's no. like awesome. No, no. You don't like Isidro. Oh my God, Steve, you don't like Isidro. We can't be friends. Oh, no, Steve, I... no one on that call. You've got a different Steve and Varsha. Yeah, Varsha too. Yeah. Uh, and Dan. No one likes Isidro. Why? What did he do? He, so his good. lines are the best. Like one of the best. I think in that, but I, I, I'm not a fan of of really of like dark worlds like that, and then having kids, like having funny kids is it just it's just one of my ah oh, it jars. Just, okay, fair enough. Yeah, they just for me it. it was like a relief. It it, it was like a relief, and uh, whether it's Sherke, whether it's uh, Lady Farney, so many delightful characters. Like I think that the moment when this sort of rough fellowship starts to uh how do i say come together is where it, it becomes very beautiful i don't know like i didn't expect when the way people talk about basa there's a lot of violence and there's a lot of sexual violence and there's not yes there is a lot of that but given that he has the graphic uh medium he has a graphic art uh, the graphic novel medium manga medium and he does. He chooses. He. This is an artistic choice that he makes to not fade to black. Uh, I don't think it was as. Like I don't. I, I have read far, far worse things in fiction, especially under the label of science fiction and fantasy, where it has seemed totally gratuitous or voyeuristic to me to the point I've been like, help! Why? I. I didn't have that why within me. Yes, I will say the eclipse, one or two panels. But ultimately, this is a male author who is like how many authors? I, I will say none. To date, none have managed to depict. It's not, I don't think it's possible. And I'm including female authors in this to depict uh, the true horror of sexual assault and choosing not to fade to black. Within those parameters, it was did not make me want to throw up, which is usually what happens in a lot of, a lot of books. Steve is like, Steve, which is your favorite arc so far, if you don't mind me asking? Um, it's the one after, uh, the Golden Age is pretty good. It's the one after the Golden Age, I forget the name. Yeah, same, uh, same. Conviction arc is mine. I, I mean, it was straight five stars, all of them. Wow. I, I, I do not, like, I know it's so funny. Every single person I've been, like, who's been seeing my Goodreads ratings and stuff is just like, what is happening? Wow. <laughs> it happens. Hmm. Nice. Uh, I will say I, I agree with you that I don't, I'm not a fan of First Law, and I don't think it's that dark at all. I don't think it's, I think on the darkness scale, it's like a three or four. I don't. I don't know. I don't think it's very dark at all. I think it's when you compare it to other darker books. I, I don't even, for my money, I don't. I mean, I don't really consider it even like a good entry to grim dark. I think it's fine. I think it's. I don't like dislike it, but I don't think it's like the grim dark uh, series to read to have an idea for the for the genre. I don't think it's a. Rep, I don't think it represents. But well, well, it depends. Everyone has a different definition of grimdark, but I don't think it's yeah, exactly. Um, you know, it's hard to say. But for me, I don't think it's really like a a gateway drug to grimdark. Maybe I don't know. But oh, interesting. But personally, for me, like whatever little lim limited I have read 
of grimdark <laughs> avoided a lot um the two with by my personal definition of grimdark the two series which are actually grimdark are i mean i've only read the first trilogy in full so the two series are first law and prince of nothing like those are the two which i would say are truly grimdark what makes them grimdark um doesn't matter what the characters want to do or not do essentially the world is nihilistic to the extreme it doesn't matter what they do because ultimately it doesn't matter i mean that's what i got from the end of last argument of kings and okay i'm uh, the the prince of nothing read along is still going on so i'm not going to talk too much about that but essentially yes it is that sense that nothing really matters and i don't think it's explained why enough for me personally like i accept this as a world view which the author is trying to espouse though it is completely at odds with mine <laughs> like i'm totally in tokian tokian school of thought where you do your best even if you don't live to see the result for the next generation that kind of feeling but um even that suppose as an interesting thought experiment i ex- i can see the subversion where you are taking on certain aspects of the hero's journey or even personality heroic personalities and twisting them but then what like that's the part that i didn't get from first law and i didn't get from prince of nothing i appreciate the subversion i i think the sub the subversion is clever especially for first law but then what you have to do something after that what is your proposed solution given that the heroic uh trope or the heroic uh, quest does not indeed work or is not feasible and i think a song of ice and fire actually depends <laughs> it's a wound in our heart but uh I think it might try to give us an answer which is why I don't think a song of ice and fire is grim dark at all. I mean it's not grim dark at all in 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 in, in uh, like it ha- it is a very dark world it's deeply misogynistic and all those things but it's it's not grim dark. It's not nihilistic for me at least. You thought there was hope in a song of ice and fire? Sure. Oh, I didn't see it but I I read it a long time ago. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, these are who I liked, who I identified with, who was getting somewhere, who was making moves. They just got killed. <laughs> right? Ah, I understand. Okay. Yeah, for me, yes. that's nihilistic. It's like, oh, you can try as hard as you want to be the hero, but you just end up with a sword in the eye. And I'm like, well, after so so many times of seeing this happen, I felt that was just as nihilistic as anything I'd ever read, having read it when they came out. No, that's totally I fair. And the last twenty years of fantasy. didn't exist when i read those books um so hmm. that context i'm working from i read them as they were published um that's that i i mean i can totally uh see your viewpoint and i think like this is what steve was saying that we each have a very very specific and almost i would say a very personalized definition of grim dark so which is why our reading of the books and the way we categorize them is quite different <laughs> I I love this comment. This is so true. Uh, um, but uh there was hope so that eventually is, someone might survive. But uh Alex the 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 sad part is that the one of my favorites I have a very bad, I have a very strong suspicion she's not going to make it. That's Daenerys. I'm 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 very very like almost 80% sure that she's not going to make it. I don't know who who are the ones who are going to survive but yeah depends on why somebody is writing the series I guess but and we'll never know I mean this is why we are so frustrated I guess because we can't guess authorial in, intent it's not possible to extrapolate we could not extrapolate a storm of swords from a game of thrones and nobody could extrapolate I'm guessing feast and dance from storm of swords 
to the point where when it came out after five years, people were like, whoa, what is this? Because he, he doubled the POVs, I think. He doubled the number of POVs and the plot progression flowed to quite a bit of a grind, grinding halt. So the experience of someone who like me who read who had the luxury of sort of reading them back to back and then rereading them back to back might be a bit different from somebody who read them as they came out. And naturally it's uh yeah, I mean it, it the only way to sort of see this is if you have ever have time or the inclination to reread the book at some point and then you don't but what if what if wins comes out george R. R. martin convinced me of something he said i can make you easy. his first three i read the first three and then i stopped mm -hmm. and he's like oh wait i don't like these and i realized he can convince me that he can make me care about a character and then he can ruthlessly kill them and i said you are right george you can do this i agree i do not want this in my life Real life can only do this to me. Huh. I've had enough people I care about actually die that I'm like, I don't need mm. this in my fiction. I don't get catharsis from it. I just get upset. So I, I write enough. books. I write books where if there's a kid that you like who's funny, I guarantee that kid will never be in danger in my books. If there's Aww. like an innocent that you care about, right, they are going to be fine. And I'll, I'll tell people out up front. I'm like, I tell you what, you're going to read my book. I'm not going to tell you what's going to happen. But the hero is going to win and the kids will survive. They'll never be kidnapped by the bad guys and used as bait. It's not going to happen. There's no sexual violence in my world. It doesn't exist. It just doesn't. For no reason. By construct? By what? construct of the author. Sorry, by construct of the author? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Just, the, no, no, char no female warrior in my character in my books has a history where she was raped as a teen and learned how to fight to get revenge on her attackers. That will never happen. Right? Like I just, I'm not making it part of my series. That's just the choice I made, right? Because I can do that. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Sure, you know, I, I wish there were more series out there like, because uh, it, it's one of the things which is so painful sometimes to read. Uh, you know, this, as you said, this, uh, this very casual sexual violence as a background throwaway plot point and then it's it's a bit it's it gets painful um if you don't mind uh, mr Bur uh, so should i call you mr burn or is joe okay call me joe <laughs> joe is okay yeah. um <laughs> steve is laughing um <laughs> joe i wanted to ask you so what are some of the books or works that you keep returning to in your mind um things which motivate you or inspire you you mean other people's work? Yeah. Maybe foundational things that made you want to tell your own stories. Uh, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, there's, there's a, so, I, I take things from many places. Yes. Right. So there are many, many worlds that are, uh, and not all of them are good, right? Like some of, some of the, my favorite series are things I read when I was young. And when I've mm -hmm. gone back to them, they're terrible. Right. They're just poorly written and they're, they have deeply flawed, but they excited some aspect of them excited part of my imagination. Mm -hmm. Like the Lensman series by E.E. E. Doc Smith, which is like the, mm -hmm. one of the really foundational space opera and had characters who were over the top, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, overpowered main characters who were flawless we would call them Gary Stews, you know, I loved those books, but I was, you know, I was 10 or 11 when I read them. Like if I'd read them for the first time at 40, I probably would have thought they were pretty bad. But, you know, so I, I, I like a lot of stuff. Lensman, I'm motivated hugely by uh, South uh, South Asian cinema. Mm. Oh yeah, give me a, uh, give me a good, uh, give me a good Hollywood movie. Uh, uh, Telugu uh, films, especially in, in inspired, uh, uh, my, my, my series, which is why I made my main character uh, half Indian. Although it doesn't really have any effect on the story, except because it takes place on a space station, you know, on the other side of the galaxy. But his mom's Telugu, and, you know, when he goes to visit her, she says, we're going to find you a wife now. <laughs> which is a very stereotypical thing to say about, like, an Indian mom, but all my Indian friends are like, no, no, keep that. That's accurate. Yeah, that's <laughs> Right. So like 
it's a stereotype, but all the Indian people I know are like, no, 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 don't, don't, don't take that out. Like that, you have to leave that in there because that is what would happen. Yeah, so, that's really funny. Yeah, I watch a lot of I watch a lot of uh, of uh, uh, Bollywood and Tollywood movies. So, but a lot of Marvel comics. Hmm. Nice. A lot of Marvel and a lot, well, a lot of other stuff. Anyway. Hey, Susanna. Hello. I'm glad you can oh, make nice it. Is Den of the Weird the name of the office you're in, or is it something else? <laughs> that's that's look. the name of the channel, but yeah, it could be called Den of the Weird as well. <laughs> the double use there, that's great. It's it's uh, Technically, it's a library, but it's filled with records and board games instead of books, so yeah. yeah nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Uh, well, since you uh, came in, will you give us an introduction? Hello, uh, my name is Susan Imaginario. I'm a writer and I run a YouTube channel, channel called Den of the Weird. Hmm. And I hang around the page showing forums a lot. Yeah, it's glad you can make it. And, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll do half and half. I'll stay, stay for about an hour. That's all right. Of course, yeah. As long as you, as long as you want to, we'll be here for a while. So, <laughs> as long as you feel like it. But, uh, but Paramita had a question for Joe. I just, uh, Paramita, will you uh, pass your question on to Susanna? Uh, yes. So I, uh, since Joe is also uh, is uh, a storyteller and a creator of worlds, and you are as well, I asked Joe, what are some of the foundational works that made you want to tell your own stories? And I know you've done a video on this, Susanna, but please tell us <laughs> again. <laughs> I'll let Joe go first because you know my story. But yeah, I'll, I'll summarize it afterwards. Oh, he just he just went. He was finishing up. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's finished. Oh, right. well, um, <laughs> well, let me go through the books. Um, I've always loved mythology, and um, mm. yeah, it, it started as a, as an exercise for my Portuguese class. Um, one of these assessment things, they asked her to write a story, and I, I wrote this uh, dialogue between Odin and Zeus, and it, it didn't go very well. Um, <clears throat> but the teacher liked it, and she encouraged me to to write, and I did. And then when I learned English, I decided I wanted to write in English, and it's hard to pinpoint what one book, I, I selected five for the video, but there's a lot more. So uh, basically American Gods, A Game of Thrones, Weathering Heights, um, 100,000 Kingdoms. Uh, that influenced me the, to, find, to refine my own voice more than anything. And uh, yeah, I'm missing one, I just realized. Um, basically, every mythological tale episode, especially Greek mythology, inspired me to write. Hmm. I always wanted to know what happened next. So just needed to figure out how how to do it. <laughs> it's the hard part, right? Hmm. Uh, since you and Joe are both here and you both have YouTube channels uh, as writers, how do you balance your time between your writing your and your channel and creating content. I mean, I can't even imagine. I mean, just one or the other is plenty to keep you busy throughout the day. But how do you do both? I don't. My channel is failing. <laughs> it's it's been abandoned for almost two months now because I I prioritize my writing mm -hmm. and uh, I've been writing, so I, I don't have time to create content. I mean. All my plans of you know weekly schedule and monthly they say that no that that completely um, that's not going to happen. I'm just gonna I'm I'm gonna create whenever I have the time or I have something to say and I want to share and that's it with no pressure. Writing comes first always, and then reading and then discussing the the things that I read and the the channel is like the last thing so. Mm -hmm. Not a good example. What about you, Joe? 
Yeah, my um, my writing is my priority, so that that that's what I like work force myself to do. My 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 YouTube channel is only when some topic comes to my mind that I want to vent about. Mm-hmm. You know the old expression, "angry man yelling at clouds." <laughs> that's my yeah. So something usually ticks me off. I try not to be too angry about it, but or some topic and like people are talking about this the wrong way. They should talk about it this way, and it and that makes the, the video very easy because it's something. Yeah. I, really want to talk about so like the prep time is almost zero it's not that i'm sitting there going okay it's thursday what am i going to talk about this week I, so i might go through two months without releasing a video which is why i have like you know not that many subscribers which is fine but the channel was i used to do this with a blog but no one read the blog and almost no one watches my channel so it's better <laughs> i've gone from no one to almost no one so that's much you know far superior. And then I like the idea of putting all these things on YouTube where they're there forever. So if someone, I'm hoping someone five years from now goes, what is the difference between science fiction and fantasy? They can watch my video and go, it's a very coherent answer. And maybe they'll use it, which they should, because when people use my genre definitions, we'd all be better off. I can't make them. I can't force it on people, but I can hope. (laughs) I'll have to go and watch that one then. (laughs) I can hope that everyone starts using my meanings of words. Everyone else should just use them and we'd all have an easier time conversing. But, you know, in the meantime, in the meantime, I've gotten to yellow clouds about the difference between science fiction and fantasy for my 30 minutes. And mm-hmm. I don't do a lot of editing. My, my production values aren't high. I'm not, my goal is not to be a successful booktuber. And that'd be cool, right? But, you know, I'm not Philip Chase. Philip Chase really works on his channel in addition to his books. So you can tell he puts a lot of effort into the editing and the lighting and the setup and the content. He really thinks about what he's doing to gain subscribers. I'm not doing any of that stuff. So I'm deliberately leaving, leaving things on the table. Mm-hmm. You know, like with the, with the YouTube channel, what, what, what do I need to do so that I can vent and feel satisfied that I vented and anyone who wants to hear it, I can say, I wrote a video about this or I made it, you know, and then, um, and then no more. Because more than that would take up more time or money that I could be spending on editing or covers or mm-hmm. my wife. Yeah. Exactly. Um, it's a good question. You know, I, and, and there was something that I, I learned while running the channel because I had all these ideas and plans. and Because I, I love doing this and I love talking and I'm fine on camera, etc. So I thought, well, I, I definitely can do that. But I've learned that even though I have no trouble talking about, say, a book or a movie, you know, say a book, you know, and rant about it for hours, you know, in discussion, if it's just me talking about it to the camera, that I, I no, I'm, I'm terrible at it. I, it doesn't inspire me to... to I can't just sit down and, you know, even if something that I like or don't like, not, not even in a, in, in a renting mood to just talk to the camera about something. There needs to be someone on, on the other side and then I'll talk. So it's, it's very hard to create content that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. I tried to write a state of burn state of the burn uh you know you know the sanderson does his state of the sanderson like blog post every year that's apparently a big oh, thing. yes i Talk. read it yeah so i was like oh i should do that because why not right like even though nobody cares so i was gonna and i did this video and i recorded the whole thing and i'm like i i couldn't stand myself after recording it like i just talked about me for like 22 minutes i'm like i can't i can't i can't put this out there so I think A.R. Witham and I are going to do one where he interviews me about the state of the burn. And I can interview him at the state of the Witham. And we'll do it as a live probably tomorrow. But oh, that's cool. yeah, that's exactly. no, it really helps, right? Having someone ask you, having that format, that back and forth, uh, mm-hmm. is uh, it just makes it easier to converse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Has the have the YouTube channels when you were active have they have they helped your your book sales? It's very early for me to say, but so far, no, I, I have not noticed anything hmm. significant. No. The people who are watching, if anything, probably made it worse because <laughs> I don't think I do a very good job YouTube. So. Oh, I'm sure. 
I write better than I sound. Okay. I mean, people who don't know me aren't watching my channel. Hmm. I don't think, or, 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 you know, they, they would have heard of my channel from some other booktuber or from Twitter. They'll know me from there. If they, it's possible some random person has checked out the videos and then said, Oh, this guy sounds like I should read his books. Maybe, but it, it can't be like, it's not a hundred people. It might be two, you know, but I, that doesn't, that's not a measurable impact on sales. Yeah, no, I, I highly doubt it. That's fine. That wasn't my goal. My goal was really just to have a place to, to vent about. What did I vent? Uh, I don't even remember. I vent about people people who review books incorrectly. Uh, please elaborate a little, please. Oh, okay. Here we go. okay. Here we go. Problem. I have a problem with ratings and reviews that don't understand what the book was trying to do. So let's say, for example, you read, let's say I read a YA book. I don't like YA. I don't like the themes. I don't like the characters. I find teeny, whiny teenagers insufferable. I just, I'm never going to like a YA book. So if I pick up a YA book, that's a really good YA book. And then I go and I give it two stars. because so I'm like, yeah, this is fine for what it is, but I don't like YA books. I'm skewing the average rating on Goodreads or Amazon down because I picked up a book that I shouldn't have read, that the marketing said was a YA book, but because it, I shouldn't be reading YA books, I don't like them. Um, but what really, what the rating should be is, is this a good example of a book of the type that people want, that people think it is? You know, the rating, if you have a YA book, the rating should be like 4.7 means this is a great YA book. 3.0 means it's a bad YA book. It shouldn't be did a bunch of people who don't like YA read my book, then my rating is low. That doesn't help your new reader. Your new reader is like, okay, it says in the description it's a YA book. If a bunch of people who don't like YA read it and gave it low ratings, it's going to make it make, it doesn't mean it's worse for me. So I think it's a, it's a mistake. And if you read a book that you realize wasn't your kind of book, as long as the marketing was clear, that's your fault. You shouldn't give it a low rating. Just don't rate it. Or say, you know what, this is a five-star YA book that I hated. And write that. I don't like YA books. I didn't like this book. But for what it was, it was really well written. Or it was really poor. You can also say this was a poorly written YA book that I don't like because it was YA. But even if I did like YA, I still wouldn't have liked it. <laughs> like you can, you can figure that out. I read books all the time because I read a lot of books that I shouldn't read because my friends wrote them. Because I know a lot of authors. Like why, you know, indie authors. And I'll read a book and I'm like, this isn't the kind of thing I normally pick up. Like this is kind of hard. Right. Or, or YA. Those are my big, like, I don't like those books ever. No matter the best examples I won't like, it's not my thing, but I can say this is, this is well done. Like objectively for what it is. It's just not what it is. Isn't what I want. So that's my feeling about reviewers and ratings, especially. Good point. And it's a very, um, it's a very vulnerable situation, right? As a writer, I, you know, reviewers can hurt me, hurt me financially. And with, and I have no recourse or, uh, I, you know, it, it's a very weird one-sided thing hmm. that happens. Like people can write, people have written very nasty things about my books, very hurtful things. And there's like nothing I can do about it. I can't comment on it. Right. Then the whole Twitter world will come down on my head like a sledgehammer. Right. But like, you just have to sit there and be like, okay. That is what it is. It really aggravates me when people make like factual mistakes. Like when they, when they, when they read your books, like the, the reviewers, which aggravates the crap out of me. Like uh, what, what, so I have a lot of different species that, that are very similar biology and someone's like, Oh, this is just lazy. And I'm like, it's, it, it's world building. Like I explain it. There's a reason that all these different people from different planets have like very similar biology. Like there's a story there. There's a reason for that. It's not lazy. It's not because I don't understand evolution. You mm -hmm. just didn't bother reading it carefully enough. Like that. Don't blame me. But that's my pet peeve. That's one of many. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah. So reviewers can make mistakes and do bad reviews in that sense. Yeah, <clears throat> I have a few of those. I don't understand. One star. This book made me feel dumb. Two stars. <laughs> maybe, maybe it wasn't the book. 
<laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I, have, I, have a, I have a feel like that. Maybe. There, there, there is one start on Reddit. I, I, I only found that out like months after while I was Googling myself. And I, I almost feel, felt sorry for that reviewer because she claimed that she read it twice and still didn't get it. But she, she went on on the rant and I was reading the review and I could tell that she read the book because, you know, the, but she really didn't get anything. I, I don't, <clears throat> she read it completely, literally, like word by word with no abstraction whatsoever. She, and she, yeah, it must have been a horrible experience, but, you know, <laughs> Just a whole post rant about it. I'm like, oh dear. No wonder it's not selling. Um, anyway. <laughs> okay. it, is, uh, it is very, that, that's my issue. I mean, people are allowed to have that opinion and rant and not understand and whatever. You know, you put your work out there, it, it's just going to happen. You know? But I, 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 I would like that we were able to have a bit more communication. Like another example of a review. I'm pretty sure that review was probably copy-paste. You know, there, there was some mistake because the blurb, you know, it started with all the, the pro forma blurb and author introduction, etc. But then everything else, apart from the name of one character that was actually wasn't spelled correctly, but might have been the, the audio book, I don't know. It, it didn't match the story. It didn't match anything, no, no matter how you interpret it. It didn't match anything that happened. And, and I really wanted to reach out and ask the, the person, you know, because it was a reviewer, of, you know, um, a blogger reviewer. And it could have been a mistake because I know they have many books and probably they just copied the review of another book or it could have happened. Mm. But I didn't know how to even ask that question Without, it, it, it imagine what it could trigger if if I ask, are you sure that review was for my book? I couldn't ask that question, That's tough. and that and, and that is wrong. You know that there should be able to be more communication. I mean, there is. I have good relationships with with several re reviewers. We talk about you know any book, including my books, and, and no problem. But it's it's an exception. The vast majority, you can't say anything. I also think that reviewers often have like idiosyncrasies. Like there's this thing in a book that bothers me, and then there are things in the, that happens in that, that happen in books that are bother a lot of readers, but not just me. And they often don't distinguish between those two. And you need to, if you're going to be a reviewer with like a YouTube channel with like two thousand subscribers or whatever, you should sort of understand. I have this personal thing that this bugs me, but it's not normal and most people won't won't bother them. And you shouldn't rate books down for that if it's just you. What I, there was this one book and it wasn't mine, but it was in a contest. And one of the judges said it really bothered the judge that the book, which was the, the point of view is a past tense. So it's being written by an adult talking about their experiences as a child. And the language was adult language. It wasn't like simplified five-year-old verbiage. But normally, when you tell a story about yourself as a kid, you're not revol you're not like devolving to the grammar of a five year old when you speak like that. It really bothered this person, and they like knocked the book down for. It. I'm like, that's your problem. That that's that's how normal stories are written. Most stories about children. If you're writing a story when I was a child, you're not going to use a five year old vocabulary to tell the story of what happens to you as a five year old, right? The dialogue, maybe what you said, but not the story. So I'm like, don't don't make that as if the person screwed up the book, as if it's a flaw. Like you have a weird hang up that's not normal. Own it. That's fine. They really bother me because I have this weird hang up. But don't pretend this author messed up, you know, by by doing a very completely normal thing as a writer. That ticked me off, especially because it's a contest. You know, there's there's stakes. You know, this person might have not made it to the next round because this judge had this very, to me, very strange dislike of this. And I would have done the same thing. If I, if I was going to tell a story about what happened to me when I was five, I don't speak like a five-year-old when I tell the story. It's just not how we do things. So there are other examples. 
it's a prohibitively difficult thing to pull off. I mean, that particular prompt. Uh, flashback to childhood while as an adult and recreating the thoughts of a child from an adult perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. My general reading sense is very, very few authors pull it off. Uh, mm -hmm. One brilliant example is for me personally is Ocean at the End of the Lane by Neil Gaiman. That's pretty much what is perfect. You're right, it's, it's not, the verbiage is not, uh, he, he is eight, he's thinking about the time when he was eight. Uh, the verbiage is not eight, but it's, it, it's the, the, there's slight change in reflection and in language. And you can tell that this 40 year old is reverting to that era where he was a different person and some of it is through a lens of nostalgia but some of it is also through a lens of profound loss so it's, it's a very difficult thing to write i i mean i i do not envy the author who tried to attempt who attempted it um it, it can usually backfire because i i know people who have said ocean is a terrible book uh, that 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 happens too like that um They've said, or 10,000 of uh, 10,000 Doors of January by Alex C. Harrow, where the author herself is an adult, but she's trying to write a 10 year old, 10 to 12 year old girl's perspective. And then there's a bit of a time forward, and I won't spoil anymore. But I think she wrote it very well. But again, it's that thing like I see so many people who've written that it was badly done. And I, I don't think that it's what they said was wrong, but. Like it worked for me and it didn't work for them. So like it's more like different perspective. I, I don't think there's a, a right or a wrong way to do it. But then I also must clarify that I'm very much like a general reader. Like I'm not a reviewer in any sense. I have a Goodreads account to just log what books I read and rate them. And I write reviews very, very rarely. And like I have like Goodreads friends who I met on Discord or from page chewing and so like maybe some of them like my updates and all. But it's like like nowhere is anybody going to take like note of my review or my rating, I think. So I can revel in the anonymity, as I say, and not be too worried. Because um I actually uh, Joe, I have done the thing that uh, you said that I I've picked up a book which is not for me. Let's say what is not for me? Horror and oh, romanticy, two big ones. And I've read it and uh, tried to read it with an open mind. And at some point, I've just gotten disgusted and been like, no, like, who likes this? I'm out. So, like, I, I think that, like, reviewer spaces, I mean, readers understand that, that when somebody has a vis visceral reaction to something, it's a personal opinion. I do uh, tend to be very, very careful when it comes to the number of ratings. Like, as you said, when a single rating can bring down or skew the average, like I'm talking about book, if I'm talking about Ocean of the End of the Lane or American Gods, which has like 800,000 ratings, nobody cares what I rate it. It's not gonna affect the average. But when anything below 500, I usually, if it's not higher than, if it's not a four star or high, I don't rate it. I just leave it. Uh, that That's the maximum I can do. But uh, if it's something above a thousand ratings, then I've checked. Like, even if I give a two star, it will not drop the average that much in the, in the second decimal place, however much I see. So, thousand ratings and above, I can be honest. <laughs> I, I will say I'm honest even with the ones below, like with very low ratings as well, but I just prefer not to record the rating in case readers just look at the average rating. I'm safe. I don't have a book with more than like 310 ratings. So I feel better now. <laughs> My heart was fluttering a bit. <laughs> I've got several years before I have to worry about getting a one-star bond by Paramita. Oh, <laughs> I've, I've but Joe, I must confess, I have like I, I mean, I have like too many unpopular opinions to the point where it's a meme now. <laughs> I've, I've, 
uh, what can I share from my wall of shame? Um, I've one starred six Malazan books. <laughs> oh my God, is that a favorite series of yours? Damn, uh, why on earth do I always pick the worst example? That is my favorite uh, series. No. Oh dear. Oh dear. One star at six of them. Why did you read six? Why did why did this, you this okay, was a mistake? I will totally admit to it. Read one, one star, and then go, oh, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna pick up the next book. Why? Why? How how does this happen, Paramita? It, it, I can uh, well I can't really explain. I can tell you what it was. It was a sheer mistake out of pure stubbornness. Um, oh one of God. the things that I face, I have faced in online communities is you didn't like Malazan because you're stupid. Okay, okay. I don't like that. You once started one of them and then you said, you know what, I'm going to pick up the next one. Yep. And then, and then you once started like, another one. No, then I'll get to the two star. You still said, I'm going to pick up another, you did this six times. That no, is... uh, I read the whole series. I read all 10 books. <laughs> I, I am I am stunned at people who will like two star my second book and then read the third book. And I'm like, please just stop. Just, just stop, I don't want your money, just go away. These are not for you. And that's fine, it's fine that my books are not for you. I'm not bad at you, dear reader, who's two starring all my books. But could you please just stop and move on to someone else and torture them with your ridiculous ratings, please? can't handle another pet no peeve. but i mean like readers can read whatever they like six and authors months. can write whatever they write whatever oh, they want like that's the freedom why? unless you love to hate mouths and why read six of them that you one star because uh i needed to read all 10 of them to say well now i can say it, that my conclusion at the end of book 10 is exactly what i had at the end of book three, which is exactly the same as what I had at the end of book one. Okay. So nobody can tell me now that you didn't go to the end where it all pays off. I'm stubborn that way. That's true. Jared, how's what's it? up? How's it going? Hey, and yeah, says here too. Oh, you're on mute. Hello. 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 Well, uh, well, both of you, both of you, give us an introduction. Everyone, all right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm Jared at um, <laughs> the Fantasy Thinker YouTube channel, and uh, at uh, here at Page Chewing, having a blast today. <laughs> nice. And hi, yeah, I'm Jose. I run the Jose's Amazing Worlds channel, and I love to take part in these conversations. Still amazed that Steve, Steve has me around. I'm as amazed <laughs> you keep coming back. So at least two of us. Yeah. <laughs> Just like herpes, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> hey, okay. Merry uh, Christmas, so, uh, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Happy New Year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations on the 100th episode, by the way. Oh, yes, very I'm, much uh, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you for okay. having me on a few episodes already. I, I wish I'd found it sooner. Uh, or found the courage to join in sooner, I think it's more to the point. Because I, I, I was listening to them um, for months before I even oh. dared to you know, say hello in, 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 in the forum. It took me a while. And I'm I'm glad I did. Really, really good times. We're pretty scary um, over there. How, how, how long has it been? I was scalded. Yeah. I didn't say anything online for, for a very long time. I was just lurking. I was like, I can't, I, I can't speak. I, I can't talk about books, you know. It's just going to get into trouble. So, <laughs> thank I you want for to... it. It was therapy. It was, uh, <laughs> I want to echo Susanna's uh, statement because I I think I've been listening since episode two, and oh, wow. it took me like <laughs> first of all it took me ages to master the 
courage to comment because then it was on YouTube to comment on this channel. Then it took me months to muster the courage to sign up on Pace Chewing Forum. But once I signed up, it was such a nice community that uh, I mean, I, I post a lot. Like, like, <laughs> frankly, I'm surprised people have not DM'd the mods to say, we are fed up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I've got two questions. I've got two questions. Then uh, the first one is straightforward enough. How long has it taken to get to hundred episodes, Steve? And the mm -hmm. second question is, what is it that you're doing that all these women are scared and takes month and takes them months to work up the courage to say hello? What what what's wrong with the community? I don't know what's with the community. Nothing. It's the internet. People in general. The, 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 community, just the community is, is great. We just needed to be Jose sure. Is teasing, but I'm just too shy. I'm scared of everyone by default. Then when I join and I get to know them or listen to them, then I get less scared. That's how I am. That's fair. That's fair. By, by default, I'm scared of everyone. I was scared of Susanna. I was scared of Jose. I was scared of Jared. And then no, when I no. saw them, when I met them, <laughs> and I talked to them, I wouldn't be scared of Joe, but I mean, I've seen your posts in the forum a bit, and I've seen you around. So, but initially, I was scared of you, definitely, in the first few minutes when I joined. Can and I say, he's scary. Sure. On, on behalf of Jared, <laughs> I, I'm going to take offense on his behalf. He, he is probably, no offense, man, quite the opposite, the least scary person uh, that you could sort of like you know on, on first meeting it's like yeah that's like a cool guy there so oh should i put on my other face like <laughs> <laughs> yeah interesting uh i think the first episode was almost two years ago i think it's been about two years um Wow, hundred episodes in two years. That's pretty spectacular. Were you done one every Friday or did you miss a stretch? No, I missed a I missed a, a few months because I stopped doing it because of work stuff. And then um thought I restarted it several months later. And then uh, I think it's been about every week. I think I took another like month, month or two off. But it's been fairly consistent. Um so very cool. Yeah. Try to be. Yeah, I, that's it. Was I never heard of it until uh, back in what was it, March or something like that? Um, when uh, Varsha twisted my arm to join, and uh, so she does, she's good at that. And uh, <laughs> I immediately signed up. <laughs> One does not say no to Varsha, but nope. <laughs> yeah, but uh. Jose, I'm hoping you have a, a, a happy update about the bike. Uh, I hope we're hoping no, that. Oh just... no, 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 no! That's it, it. Went. It was last week. Um, it was some um, Sunday morning. So we live in a block of flats. We live in the fourth floor, and there's the lift, the landing, and then there's the stairs. So we keep, you know, my my kids' bikes in the landing on the stairs side. So when you come out of the lift, you don't see them. You have to go around to the stairs. So Sunday morning, last Sunday, my wife went out with the kids. And as soon as they close the door, like 10 seconds later, they're knocking on the door. I was like, you know, oh, what have they forgotten now? And she was like, oh, did you move Santiago's bike? And I was like, no, it's, it's there. And she was like, it's not there. So we looked and it's like, yeah, it's it's gone. Like literally someone came up to the fourth floor to steal what is obviously a kid's bike. This, this, you know, it's unmistakably an eight-year-old's bicycle, and they took one but not the other. So maybe they come in next week for the other one. I don't know. But then, you know, what are you going to do? Start ringing on people's doors and start knocking on people's doors, asking, "Where's my bike? You little piece of so and so." So anyway, yeah. Good. You could hire Joe to beat someone up. <laughs> <laughs> If anyone, if anyone is available, um, yeah. I mean, I'll be honest. There's a couple of suspect people in the building where we are, but even though I've got my suspects, I've got no evidence. So, um, yeah, I'm not quite there yet. Yeah, I had my bike stolen when I was about eight or nine years old. It sucks. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's 
some guy was walking it's really by annoying. and it, it's really he annoying. was walking by in the street and he was like it was an older guy and i was on a bike in the street and he said hey uh can i borrow your bike i'll give you five bucks i'm like you know i'm a towhead i'm like oh okay <laughs> never saw it again <laughs> oh no yeah but like who steals a kid's bike on the week of Christmas? Like you have to be a rotten <laughs> character. You are you are condemned to hell and you're never coming out of that. <laughs> and uh, Alex commented, Jose, you have a nickname? What, what's your nickname? Me? Yeah. For what? I don't know. Have I got a nickname? Yeah, I'm not sure. I've been uh, called many things in my life, but um, uh, actually, I do. But you know what? I don't want to say it because it's taken me. Was it taking me? Twenty-five years to get rid of it. Kid, yeah, in my family, everyone called me by my nickname, which is what they used to call my grandfather. For some reason, I inherited it. Out of the fifteen grandchildren, I'm the one that inherited it. So wherever I went, and my family always called me by that nickname, and at school, even the teachers, everyone. So I was that person. And to the people um, that know me from when I was a kid, that's still what they call me. So I literally had to move countries when I was 18. I had to go to the UK and... Oh, you're muted. Wasn't me. <laughs> no, me, sorry. Um, so I had to move countries to start using my proper name and for people to meet me for the first time and start calling me by that. So I literally had to change lives and still annoys me when I go back to my parents, they still call me by that nickname. My friends from childhood do, but at work, um, so my wife, she knows me by my actual name. Um, yeah, it's fun and really irritating. Mm -hmm. What is the nickname? I think like, I wouldn't mind. Oh. Sorry, Joe. I'm not saying, like, like. I wouldn't mind saying your case. You're Susanna. Someone calls you Susie. Some sort of derivative of your name. I could live with that. I'm, I'm assuming that Joe is Joseph. You know, that's. So if I was called something along those lines, it would be okay. But it's nothing to do with that. It's a totally random thing. So I. Nah. Sorry, this is this is a cultural thing that's funny that I, I don't see enough of in fantasy. So my wife's from Bangladesh, and uh, everyone in her family has like, um, first of all, everyone has a nickname that's different than what's on their like driver's license. So no one in the family will call my wife by the name that's on her birth certificate. Like they won't. Some half of her cousins don't know what that is, right? So that she has got like the name on the driver's license, which is what white people have to call her. Then she's got the family nickname. And then they have very specific names for every different relation. So if you're like, like, you know, in English, we just have a kind of aunt, uncle, cousin, but there are many more words for the individual der derivations. So every person in our family gets called something different by every other person in her family. And whenever I'm there, I'm just like, so lost. And I know everyone, but I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna call you all uncle and aunt. And we're gonna, we're gonna all forgive me because I have no idea. But I feel like in fantasy novels, we don't do enough nicknames. When the nicknames have nothing, it's, it's what Joe was saying. It's not like short, like her name is Monica. Her, the family doesn't call her like Money or Nika, nothing like that. It's completely different. It's very weird. Well, not weird, it's completely normal. It's just not my culture. And they all just call me Joe. And there's no second name. I don't get us. I don't. I didn't get us a nickname after being in the family. <laughs> Maybe ten more years, and they'll give me a nickname. I'm, I'm sure it's all structured and regimented, and you have to go through some kind of process and, and meet certain. You know, I have a shot criteria. at being the oldest person in this generation from a certain perspective, and that gives you a certain authority that I don't deserve over like stuff. It's very funny. But we'll see what happens when that when I get there. I'm getting there. And uh, Alex commented, it was a reference to the like herpes comment from a while ago. 
Oh, we'll, we'll call Jose that herpes guy from now on? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm totally cool with that. This is a story there, right? I just got to that stage in my life where, you know, if that's it, that's it, you know, like, whatever. You didn't have to explain it, right? Like, why do they call you that herpes guy? Well, you see. You need a story. Very true. Yeah. Um... So for uh, we were just discussing uh, reviews and reviewing and Parmeet the uh, one star in Malazan books, uh, <laughs> but uh, we'll get to that here in a second. If you're watching or if you're here, just nothing's gonna change. But I'm just gonna cut the audio, so we'll start the second uh, part. So uh, if you're listening, then just hang on, and the second part will be available to you. <laughs> 